When Beowulf learns of the dragon, he has forebodings of his impending doom. The poet tells us plainly that this will be Beowulf's last fight. This detail deepens the mood of loss. We read with heavy hearts, knowing the inevitable conclusion of the fight and of the poem. The repeated reminders of his imminent death only strengthen our foreboding. We know that we are watching the last heroic stand of a good king against the unending flood of evil in the world. After finishing his speech about the Swedish feud, Beowulf then made a formal boast for the last time, the poet says. He tells his thanes that he will face the dragon, the sky plague, alone. He says that he would prefer to fight the dragon barehanded, without a sword, like he fought Grendel, but since the dragon will fight with molten venom and the fire he breathes, Beowulf will use armor, shield, and sword. The king resolves to accept his fate courageously, whatever it may be. I won't shift a foot when I meet the cave guard. What occurs on the wall between the two of us will turn out as fate, overseer of men, decides. I am resolved. Finally, he urges his men to remain there in safety. He says, this fight is not yours, nor is it up to any man except me to measure his strength against the monster or to prove his worth. I shall win the gold by my courage, or else mortal combat, doom of battle, will bear your lord away. Beowulf goes to the mouth of the cave and shouts his battle cry. The lord of the Yates unburdened his breast and broke out in a storm of anger, the poet says. And the dragon responds quickly, pouring forth in a hot battle fume. The battle is fierce, but balanced for a time, described in bright poetry. Just as we begin to think Beowulf might prevail... The poet tells us that final day was the first time when Beowulf fought and fate denied him glory in battle. Beowulf strikes with his sword, but the weapon fails to bite. The dragon responds with a spasm of battle fire, wreathing the the ruler of men in the certainty of coming death. The sword is the same glittering sword that Hyalak gave Beowulf after he returned from the Danes. The failure of the sword connects this fight to Hyalak's failure in battle as well, underscoring the irresistible, inevitable ruin of every king in every kingdom. Beowulf thinks to himself, it was no easy thing to have to give ground like that and go unwillingly to inhabit another home in a place beyond, so every man must yield the leasehold of his days. Terrified by the fire and violence of the dragon, Beowulf's men broke ranks and ran for their lives to the safety of the wood, abandoning their king in his greatest need. Wiglif alone remained steadfast. When he sees his lord tormented by the heat of his scalding helmet, he remembers the gracious gifts his king had given him and rushes to his side, wading the dangerous reek and went under arms to his lord. Line 2661. But the battle turns tragic when Beowulf's infallible sword shatters on the dragon's scales. Immediately, the dragon attacks a third time, a significant number, and bites Beowulf in the neck, giving him a mortally venomous wound. Wiglif ignores the dragon's head and fire and stabs it in the belly, which begins to weaken its flames. Beowulf gathers his strength and stabs the dragon in the flank with his knife, giving it its death wound. Together, Beowulf and Wiglif have have dispatched the dragon, but the king's life is ebbing away, deadly poison superating inside him. Beowulf rests against the rampart, studying the stones, while Wiglif washed his lord's wounds, swabbed the weary prince with water, bathed him clean, unbuckled his helmet. The dragon is dead, but the king is dying.